Okay, hi everybody. Can folks hear me okay with my mask on? Okay, um, so thank you all for being here. This is a great crowd. Um, we are here to talk about LGBTQ plus affirming housing. And I will admit this is my first in-person conference since February 2020. So I'm happy to be here and I, it's kind of weird to be in person again. Um, so we're changing things up a little bit because Mildred could unfortunately not be here today. So what we're gonna do is I'm gonna talk a little bit about SAGE and some of the work that we do. And then I'm gonna introduce uh, my panelists here and we're gonna go from there. Um, this is being audio recorded, so just so folks know if we could save questions until the audience Q&A, we'll have plenty of time to do that, okay? Um, so my name is Sydney Cop Richardson. I'm the director of SAGE's National LGBTQ Plus Elder Housing Initiative. I've been at SAGE for a little over three years. Uh, before SAGE, I actually worked at Shinny, so I'm glad to be here with family. And my pronouns are she, her, and hers. Um, for those that are not familiar with SAGE, we offer a variety of programs, both local to New York City and nationally. We've been around since 1978. Um, we have SAGE centers in all of the boroughs, which are senior centers um, for LGBTQ plus elders or seniors. Um, and we work to provide support and services and advocacy for LGBTQ plus elders, both locally and across the country. Um, these services and resources along with our advocacy work are vital for queer elders as we see particularly now the heightened risks that people are facing, the complications around health, longevity, financial insecurity, the lack of familial support, difficulty in securing long-term housing, and advanced discrimination that we, um, I know our community is particularly feeling in this moment. Uh, so we know that affordability and safety is a challenge for LGBTQ plus elders. And in 2015, SAGE developed the National Housing Initiative. We provide technical assistance and support for people across the country looking to develop LGBTQ plus affirming affordable rental housing. And we also do work um, looking at different models of alternative housing that um, can be good for people when some of our systems are not working well for us. I wanna take a step back and level set a little bit. Um, I'm gonna share a few statistics. According to the Equal Rights Center, about half of older same-sex couples applying for senior housing were subjected to discrimination. And on top of that, half of single LGBTQ plus elders believe they will have to work well beyond retirement age compared to 27% of their single counterparts. Um, about half of LGBTQ plus elders are extremely concerned about having money to live on compared to 36% of non-LGBTQ plus peers. And one in four transgender older adults reported discrimination in, experiencing, in, in seeking housing. We know that that number is probably much higher because of the incredible lack of data collected both on LGBTQ plus aging and elder populations, but particularly on transgender um, communities and transgender folks needs. Um, so isolation is huge for people as they age, but we see that it is really huge for LGBTQ plus elders, and this is for many reasons. Um, we have often relied on family of choice when we have experienced family rejection. Our networks are often made up of folks who are around the same age. Uh, when we think about the impact of the HIV epidemic, people have lost people throughout their lives. Decades of discrimination have impacted LGBTQ plus elders who came of age at a time when it was literally illegal to be gay or to be trans. So um, the prejudice that folks that we work with at SAGE is not just individualized and interpersonal, but it's deeply systemic. Um, folks might have had experiences with being labeled mentally ill or institutionalization. Um, the, at the time of McCarthyism and the Lavender Scare, people could have been fired, arrested, sent to uh, be incarcerated, sent to mental institutions for being who they were. Um, in 1953, President Eisenhower signed an executive order that defined, amongst other security risks, sexual perversion as a cause for being fired from employment. And so for many people, we need to think about this when LGBTQ plus elders are showing up in our spaces around the kind of collective trauma um, that, that people bring and the mistrust of systems and the ways that this can rapidly impact aging. We are seeing not just for queer communities, but we see the um, rates of cognitive decline um, are much higher for LGBTQ plus people because of the impact of oppression on aging. 
<clears throat> so knowing this context, we see some of the most identified challenges that LGBTQ plus elders face or revolve around their housing or their medical set settings. Like I said, many LGBTQ plus elders might not be engaged in their medical care because of a history of traumatizing experiences. Um, we see the impact of interpersonal violence, healthcare barriers, employment discrimination, and other forms of inequity that are deeply tied to an ability to live long and to age well and safely. So just a few examples, which I know folks in this room are probably familiar with, shelter access and safety is a huge issue. If a homeless shelter is a pathway to housing and you're not safe in shelter, particularly for trans communities, that's um, entirely blocked off as an option, right? The invisibility and data collection, like I mentioned, family of origin loss or rejection, lack of lo local legal protections, income disparity, healthcare discrimination and trauma, landlord discrimination, the risk of intimate partner violence or elder abuse or exploitation, and racism. Um, we know that this is all deeply compounded for black, indigenous, and other POC elders. Um, people of color who are LGBTQ plus have had to deal with massive forms of racism systemically, interpersonally throughout their lives. And we know that racism might often be more of an issue for LGBTQ plus elders than their sexual orientation or their gender identity. So we cannot ignore the legacies of racism in this country, in this world, um, when we look at the ways that this plays out in housing policy and criminalization um, and in the context of being LGBTQ, an LGBTQ plus person of color. So um, just quickly, what is LGBTQ plus affirming elder housing, it's simply housing that provides a welcoming environment of culturally competent services with community peers and allies. We can talk a little bit more about what affirming or friendly means and why we use that language, particularly regarding fair housing law. Um, and SAGE was involved in developing um, New York City's first two LGBTQ plus affirming residences, uh, Stonewall House in Fort Greene, Brooklyn, and Cretona Pride House in the Bronx. Um, and both are 100% affordable with tenants making 50% 50 50 and below the area median income. So I know that um, my colleagues are gonna talk about this, but some things that we um, really talk a lot about when we're providing TA with folks across the country is what is cultural competency or what is culturally affirming services? Um, what are safety protocols that are trauma informed? We know that many LGBTQ plus elders have experienced massive forms of incarceration or police violence, right? So when we're talking about safety, particularly for LGBTQ plus elders of color, safety looks different for different people. We need to think about that when we're talking about safety procedures. Um, understanding unique health challenges, providing opportunities to break isolation, and providing onboarding tools like community agreements, affirming programming, um, having visual representation in spaces, and having affirming intake forms. Um, and these are just some examples, you know, when you think about the art in a space, when you p think about the signifiers in a space, many LGBTQ plus seniors or elders might not feel safe or comfortable or might not be used to disclosing their um, gender identity or their sexual orientation, but if they see signifiers in a space, if there are um, policies and procedures that are openly and readily available and enforced, which is key, then that might change the way that someone who has not felt like they can trust institutions throughout their life build a little bit more trust with case management, with property management, et cetera. Um, so I share this to help frame the context for the need for affirming housing across the age spectrum. We're not just talking about elders today, um, but we know that uh, LGBTQ folks, we are not just defined by our trauma. We have joy, we uh, have resilience, and there is lots of beauty, beauty in queer community. And the reason that I center some of the things we need to think about in trauma is just because we can do better in the spaces that we provide. Um, so I would love to introduce now our wonderful panelists. We have Jonathan Castro, Program Director of Walton House and Therapeutic Horticulturalist at Jericho Project. We have Justin Palmer, a tenant at Jericho Project, and we have Sarah Falkins, clinical case manager at Homeward New York City. Um, so first I'm gonna turn it over to Jonathan to chat a little bit. Awesome. <clears throat> so Jericho Project actually celebrated its 40th year this year, uh, but Walton House is its newest uh, supportive housing program. It opened in 2018, the summer of 2018, 
and we serve two populations. We serve young adults aged 18 to 26 uh, that we get referred from uh, the CAP system, uh, the 2010E, um, and we have 56 veterans uh, that we get referred to through HUDVASH, through the, um, the Bronx VA and the Manhattan VA. Uh, we provide programming across uh, age groups, across uh, population. Uh, so we have art therapy, horticultural therapy, Zen Hour, Bingo, and independent living skills, amongst other things. Um, and so the, the program is unique, not just because of the two populations that we serve, but it's the first time the city allowed uh, or gave even an inkling of um, space for two publishers to come together and provide, and, um, sorry, I lost my words, uh, <laughs> for young adults to get that, uh, those services. 1515 was, it's a pretty new program. Uh, we have 1515 Families, which we also serve. Um, and so being the first program allowed us to have a lot of uh, leeway to introduce things that we wouldn't have been able to do in other, pro uh, other programs such as Pop A. Uh, we do incentives, uh, so we give young adults money to actually complete goals. So if a person wants to become a, vet a veterinarian, um, we break that goal down, right? Because you know you cannot be in a veterinarian tomorrow. So it's about getting your GED, it's about getting registered for school, it's about getting those classes, maintaining those grades, right? And then we incentivize every part of that process to give the person kind of hope that this is gonna be uh, doable. Um, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, but it's that we, sort of pro we provide that net uh, to catch them when they don't succeed. Uh, and we don't judge them for that. Um, so we'll talk a little bit more about what the, our affirming services look like in a few with some of the questions we're gonna answer, but just want to give you a little bit of a insight of what we do at Jericho. Great, thank you. Um, next, I would like to introduce Justin. Can you talk a little bit for us? Um, everyone can hear me correctly, right? Yes. Okay, cool. Hi. Good afternoon, sorry, I've been up a lot today. <laughs> um, I'm Justin, I'm part of the KIA program at Jericho. The KIA program mostly enlists getting help in terms of like certifications, education, um, helping out um, young youth in terms of getting further ahead in terms of finances and stuff like that. Um, it's been very helpful to me because when I first started in the Kia program, that was about 2020 when I was just getting into my first apartment and um, I had to learn how to, you know, finance, how to um, pay my own bills, um, keep up with a bank account, keep up with the rent, do like all the adult things that nobody really teaches you and it was actually really scary at first, but the people in Kia actually really did help me in terms of giving me information because I'm the type of person that enjoys getting information in terms of like um, pamphlets, forms, information in terms of what happens when I talk to my landlords, information in terms of like what's the state rules in terms of like dealing with your landlords, what's the state rules in terms of oh how much money, how much money can I break down this week or this month and they gave me all of that, all the little things that nobody really teaches you in terms of really taking care of yourself when you're a young adult. Um, and that's something that you don't really see in most um, places when they just kind of just throw you into the system and then just kick you out and just give you a house and say, here you go. It's like, so what do I do from here? <laughs> <laughs> and then they even took it a step further in terms of, because you know when you're young, you kind of want to do a lot and it's like, <laughs> you don't know where you want to go, but you have a, like an idea of the journey they helped simplify it for me in terms of, as Jonathan said, breaking it down in terms of, okay, where do you need to go? Where do you need to start? Let me give you a starting point. For, my, for me, my starting point was first getting out of retail, which I hope some of y'all know, remember how retail was. Um, and then my first starting point was security. And then from there, I was able to get my first medical job working during COVID. And now I'm back in security, so if I didn't have that first security job, I wouldn't have the job that I have now, and I wouldn't be on my way to getting into a better form of medicine with the next certificate that I'm getting. So when you're dealing with your, I don't wanna say students, when you're dealing with your, I can't say patients either. <laughs> participants. People. Participants, people, <laughs> yeah. youth. There we go, thank you so much. Um, you're not only dealing with them in terms of like they're a number, but you're dealing with them in terms of they're a person. Like you have to understand that that person has their own journey, has their own life, and you're not only helping shaping them as a person, you're also helping them push forward as a person. So 
all the little things that you do in terms of even checking on them, even like working with them in terms of emails or working with them in terms of, okay, you have a job today from one to four. Is it possible that I can call you during your break time is more than a help, is more of a help than you could possibly know. Um, because when you're working and going to school or working and taking certificate classes, the amount of emotional toll on it on you is a lot. The amount of physical toll is a lot because you have to be able to stay up. You have to be able to be coherent. You have to be able to listen and be attentive. And being able to work with somebody on that level instead of just not treating them as like a number, treating them as like, oh, I just have to like do this and I'm gone. No, it's, e it's a lot easier for them and you because it shows that you care. And in this day and age, a lot of people don't do that but I've had a wonderful experience with Jericho in terms of they show me that they care in terms of like they really take the time to actually listen they take the time to actually what's the word I'm looking for they take the time to actually go over with me and counsel me on the types of decisions that I'm willing to make I'm sorry if I ran across <laughs> no, <good>. no, <laughs> thank, you. thank you thank <laughs> you Um, Sarah, could you tell us a little bit about Homeward? And I remember the True Colors ribbon cutting with Cindy Lauper. <laughs> yes, yes, that's how we started. Hi, everybody. I'm Sarah. Uh, she, her, hers pronouns. Um, I am one of the clinical case managers with Homeward NYC. Um, Homeward does service a network of different populations. We service seniors. We also service single women and their families. The division I'll be speaking about today is what is previously called our True Colors division. Uh, we provide congregate supportive housing for uh, LGBTQAI young adults. Um, we have three different sites. Our first site, the one that Cindy Lawfer was at about 12 years ago, uh, is in West Harlem. Um, we service about 30 adults there between 18 to 24 is that age range, and they fall under uh, POP E. We also have another site in the Bronx, uh, POP A, and we service, I think, about 30 adults at that site as well. Again, young adults, 18 to 24. I'm here today also to talk about a new site that we're opening in Central Harlem, where we'll have housing for 50 plus new uh, LGBTQAI will be our priority community. Uh, young adults, 18 to 25, who fall under the new NYC 1515. Uh, we'll, we provide supportive on-site care. So every resident comes to us um, and their rent is based on how much they make and their income. And then from there, every single resident gets provided with a human service staff. They'll get a clinical case manager to support them along their way, as well as a life skills manager to help with their ADLs and improve their life skills. And there's a program director to help drive the ship along the way. Um, what I love most about our program is there is no time limit. So there were technically not permanent housing. We think of ourselves as transitional. If residents need to stay with us long term and forever, they can. Um, so it's really, really a beautiful site where we're able to provide that individualized one-on-one -on -one care. So time frame doesn't matter. Our clients come to us from a range of different things. We service all LGBTQ adults. Uh, many are coming from the foster care system, so they're coming from nothing. And a lot of our adults are coming to us from foster care because of rejection from their families. So we're really there to not only provide that service staff, but just a baseline of support, trust, and if we can, almost parenting for some kids who have never gotten it before in their lives. Um, so we're there to meet the kids where they're at and help them grow and develop. Um, our average length of stay for our tenants at our other three sites is about four and a half years. But like I said, that's completely individualized on the person. We address everything from the trauma they've experienced over their life, all the intersectionality within that, as well as just how to get a job how to manage a bank account, all of those first level steps that Justin was touching on, we really try to touch base on with our clients to make sure that they're successful long term. And our goal is always that eventually once they're ready to move on and out, um, they, can, they can live without support, but we're always there for them long term. Um, and that's what Homeward NYC provides. Wonderful, thank you. Um, so I'm excited to open it up to some questions and we're gonna open it up to the audience in a bit. I'm sure people have things they wanna ask. Um, but first, I'm just gonna throw a few things out there and I, whoever wants to answer first can. But what are some of the barriers to safe and affordable housing 
that you see and the LGBTQ plus communities that you are serving or that you are a part of? Um, so they're, they're very, <clears throat> They're very much in line with the kind of the overall struggles that most people have finding affordable housing in New York City, um, except that our young adults uh, who have been in uh, either homeless or in the system start off at a disadvantage of not having the support systems as a lot of other people do. Um, so if you can imagine, it, if let's say you get all the support you want in the world, you graduate high school, you go get your uh, associate's, your bachelor's, you graduate, you get an entry level job, most people, even with those um, structures in place, can't afford New York City as an, uh, for an apartment. So if you take that same structure and apply it to someone who was abandoned, um, kicked out their house at 16, has not gotten a high school diploma, has no support, has very little money, and you tell them now to find housing in New York, you can imagine what their uh, outlook is gonna look like. So for, for a lot of our young adults, it's really about being able to get across a program, a shelter, something that has a, um, connection to 2010 E's can can get into the CAP system, sub, uh, submit an application for them, um, make sure they they meet all the criteria, which means that they have to show that they have a uh, either, depending on what population you're going for, either a substance use issue, a mental health issue, you've been homeless a certain amount of years. Um, and for a lot of people, they don't even have the, like you were alluding to earlier, they don't have the proof of that because they don't trust the shelter. And so when we're trying to get that information, and I used to work at a drop-in center, when we're trying to get that information, it's really about can you provide a letter from a friend that you stood in the, on the couch? Um, did you service any drop-in centers? Did you go to a church, right? So that you can then build a case saying that this person was homeless for two years. Um, because the system doesn't really want to hear the narrative, they want to see the, the facts. Um, so really, uh, I would say is no different than what other New Yorkers face, except that they are starting with a disadvantage. Yeah, and just to add to that, I think it's also identifying our priority clientele, which is the LGBTQ. Because within the 2010, any one of the barriers we're facing, there's not a way to identify our community yeah. and to find the kids that we need to serve. And we know that there's a crisis with the LGBTQ community and homelessness, yet trying to identify them or find them is, is a challenge right now and yeah. something that I hope we can improve upon. But we are, we're getting calls from people who are on the streets and they're not yet comfortable going into the shelter system or they don't want to go in to the shelter system, especially as LGBTQ, because it's not safe for them. Mm -hmm. So they don't want to go, but they have to be in the shelter system in order to get to our level of care. So it's, it's how do we break that barrier and how do we create a safer shelter system um, so they can then get to that higher level of housing. Yeah, and to add to that as well, it's even if the 2010E allowed for a space to identify someone who was LGBT, um, New, York, uh, New York City, New York State law doesn't allow us to uh, target individuals based on their sexual orientation. Um, that is uh, housing discrimination. So um, I think the next question is about how do we oversee that, so I'm gonna skip a little bit. Um, <laughs> but it's really about creating connections with uh, agencies that work primarily with LGBTQ individuals and letting them know, hey, we have two vacancies coming up. So they can then advocate on their end to get their people on the referral list so we can get them. Uh, we get three at a time, so it's, and we don't have a say so who we get. So uh, it's really about the, the CBOs really getting their, their clientele on that list. So that is one way we can um, kind of circumvent that. But like you said, even if um, the 2010E does leave a space for somebody to identify the sexual orientation, they, we cannot uh, deny housing to anyone in New York City based on that uh, for being LGBTQ or not. So, uh, so even though we are LGBTQ friendly, right. we are not it's LGBTQ priority. positive. Priority uh, goes to right. Yeah, it's it's interesting because um, building senior housing that is LGBTQ affirming is you know takes a lot of work to do the outreach and the marketing because you cannot build LGBTQ plus exclusive housing anywhere because of fair housing law. Um, but we've thought about what if there were ways to mark deep vulnerability, particularly for trans communities that do not feel safe in shelter. So um, what if there were different categories? What if we expanded domestic violence? I'm gonna throw this out there, people might totally disagree with me. Um, and there's a category for surviving gender-based violence, right? How could that address the needs of communities that are experiencing highly disproportionate rates of violence? Um, so. Uh, we, we need to think policy-wise around like how to capture the deep vulnerability of our communities. Um, thank you. Justin, can I ask you a question? Mm -hmm. um, so can you talk a little bit, do you have anything you would like to share about what has felt affirming for you either um, at Walton House or 
um, an experience you had with a provider, like what is what does affirming care or housing look like? Affirming care or housing looks like to me when you have a willingness to learn. Um, so the thing I like about Jericho or even Walton House for that matter is that, how can I put this? They don't come in with information or they don't come in thinking that they know everything about um, the society or how people live their lives and stuff like that. They come in as in, okay, I know this much. Can you tell me more or can you tell me your experience specifically? Because what I notice with some organizations is that they'll think that they know everything there is to know about being an um, LGBTQ person in New York and it can be like as little as 10% of what the actuality is. So it's very refreshing that when you go into an organization or you go into a group and you're more so asked rather than told, what, what, what is your life like? How can I help you? What do you go through? What um what is ways I can make this better? What are ways that has been worse for you? Stuff like that. Because even in the LGBTQ community, as Sydney and Jonathan both stated, um, people have disproportionate levels of violence against them. And even in our community, it varies from either gay, lesbian, or even trans, or even bisexual. Everyone experiences something different along the spectrum. So even when you're dealing with a person from the group, you have to understand that um, a trans person might experience more violence from men, they might experience more violence from women, a lesbian might experience more violence from men, or a gay man might experience more violence from women. Like, you never know who, you never know it has to be a case-by-case -case basis. You can't just come in and think that, oh, okay, this is a gay man, he experiences um, violence from gay men. No, he could have been raised in a house of women who were, se who were um, sexually misogynistic. Or, he, or there can be a lesbian woman who naturally experiences violence from men and it makes her a little more apprehensive of dealing with men. That's the, kind of the nitty gritty of it. Thank you, thank you so much for that. <clears throat> yeah, I think also thinking about like the assumptions we have around who's a perpetrator and who's a survivor of violence and mm -hmm. dismantling that, right? Um, can folks talk a little bit about maybe what makes some of the programming in your housing unique um, for vulnerable LGBTQ folks? Or are there kind of key components? Is there physical infrastructure in the actual architecture of the building? Are there therapeutic programs? Could folks talk a little bit about that? Mm. Uh, yeah. I can, I can oh, go. I'm happy to go. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, I would say like it's not just Pride Month in June. We always have Pride Month. <laughs> um, and there's I think it's uh, one is it's just your imaging and your marketing and making sure that when clients are walking in, people are walking in, they they understand that they're coming to a safe space. If that's having a pride flag on your desk, as minor as that sounds, it's letting them know that's safe. I'm a safe space. Um, having most staff having their pronouns, whether your pronouns seem obvious or not, keeping that out so that way for those who do have different pronouns, um, they feel comfortable sharing that and they know that it's a safe space to share that, as well as even in your paperwork. Um, as much as we're dealing with government organizations who are maybe a little more behind our front facing, if a client has a preferred name, making sure that we're respecting that at all times and that uh, that's how we refer to them and we're ready with that trauma-informed care for when their dead name is continually brought up and knowing that when they receive paperwork from us that maybe has their dead name, we're ready, there's a clinical counselor there to cope with that, to help, and then most importantly to advocate for that change. To go to HRA, to go to these places and make sure we're there to advocate so it's not all on our clients to advocate for the change, we're there advocating for the change as well. Um, even things with gender, keeping it open, don't have options. Just leave it open, let your client write what they identify as. And sexual orientation, don't leave a list, keep it open. So we try to do everything from paperwork to the appearance, our marketing, making sure that what they see when they go to the Homeward website or when they walk into a Homeward building is people who look like them, who represent them. And I think that can come down to the staffing as well. Making sure there's representation within the staffing. Um, making sure that people identify within the community who work for you. So people who sit down and work with counselors aren't just dealing with people who can't understand their experience, but instead we're bringing in people who understand their life experience. Another step we went, um, we've even hired in um, an organization called Trans Equity, 
and we brought them in to consult us to meet with our clients because our clients came to us and said there's not enough trans um, trans representation in the staffing so we heard them we listened and we hired people to come in so I think that representation is huge it makes all the difference on creating a safe space for your clients as well as servicing the clients and uh, making sure the messaging within your office as a worker is clear that it's a safe space yeah um, to piggyback off of that you know I also think about programs that are not necessarily LGBTQ um, focused and so when I, I chuckled a little bit when we said, how do you make that affirming, you know, I've come across um, colleagues, unfortunately, who when they think about how do I make a program more LGBTQ friendly, and it's like, oh, do they have to vote? I'm like, you're doing a, a potluck. It doesn't mean I have to vote with a bowl of spaghetti in their hands. Um, you have to create a space where uh, people feel like it's okay to be themselves, right? That is the core of any program. Um, LGBTQ as an umbrella um, is really just... Um, it's an identification that goes across spectrums, right? So we have veterans who identify as LGBTQ. We have elders that identify as LGBTQ. Uh, LGBTQ. Uh, we have people who have disabilities who uh, identify as LGBTQ. So it doesn't matter if this is a specific program, if you're working with young adults or a specific population that works directly with LGBTQs, Q individuals keep saying youth. Um, I think that one has to understand that everything you do has to be affirming and everything you do. Um, and so, you know, we have bingo, right? I, I run a, uh, uh, I do this thing once a week that I call PD Hour, where I allow tenants to come play bingo with me, and it allows them direct access to the program director. They can ask me things, they can say, hey, I have this work order that hasn't been done yet, can you help me with this? Um, I've been trying to get this thing with SSI, can you help me with that? Um, and sometimes it's just, you know, shooting the breeze and just talking. And one thing that I, I always try to leave the space for is for them to talk about current events. Um, and you know, with everything happening in Florida now, with you know banning of, of, of drag queens and books and, and whatnot, I'm hoping everybody in this room is on one spectrum of that. But just in case you aren't, um, <laughs> it allows it allows them to talk about it, get the actual facts, uh, talk about that is. And then we have some veterans who are very hardcore um, folks who are like, you know, when I grew up, there was no such thing as LGBT, and yet they're the most supporting, supportive people we have in the building to protect our young adults. Um, and so allowing a space where they can share their ideas um, <clears throat> really gets support in that way. It has nothing about, you know, it's great to always do that, you know, put the flags up, do all those things, but it doesn't always have to be that out yeah. in your face, right? It can be very subtle. Uh, and people freak out about that, right? Same thing, I'm very big on making sure the staff looks like the population we're serving, right? But even the, the folks on my staff that aren't LGBTQ are allies, right? There are people that are building trust within the community of young folks that I have to show, you know what, even if you come across someone who isn't LGBTQ, they can still support you. You don't have to be fearful of everybody, right? Um, and, it, and it's a sad reality that they're gonna go into a world that is not always going to be accepting, but it's about giving them the tools, right? It's about when they're ready to move on for Walton House and they you know, take their Section 8 voucher and they move into their own apartment, that these are your rights, right? This, this is what your landlord can and cannot do to you, right? Just make sure you pay your rent, right? <laughs> That's the number one thing, make sure you pay your rent. Um, but at the end of the day, it's really about how do we give those skills to our young adults so they go into the world and be successful. And it can't just be about voguing, it can't just be about you know showing uh, to Wang Fu, like these are all great ideas of programming, but it needs to be a little more intentional than that. Thank you. I like the to Wang Fu. <laughs> it's one of my favorite movies. That's a good one. <laughs> I didn't um, see it until COVID. <laughs> I, I want to open it up to the audience in a minute, but I, I just want to ask um, one more question for now, and we can come back if we need to. Um, and maybe, not to put you on the spot, Justin, but I'll start with you. Um, <laughs> is there anything you want housing providers, service providers, medical staff, government folks, people in the room to know to better address the needs of LGBTQ plus folks? Mm, I would say communication in terms of knowing what, I keep on saying patient, um, knowing what your um, population needs or wants. So I can say the, what is it called? The needs of a trans person, gay, lesbian, or bisexual person may vary. So one one person might need um, e pills, one person might need t pills. One person might want to um, dress um, different genders or cross dressing, or even having communication in terms of like helping them build confidence or helping them build structure in their lives. Because as a gay person, 
when you feel comfortable enough to be yourself in a workplace that's not necessarily LGBTQ, it's actually very affirming because then when other gay people see you, they're gonna be like, oh, okay, I can be more myself around here. I don't have to like stifle myself because something that does happen in the gay community a lot is, I'm sure everyone here knows what code switching is. Um, a lot of people eventually have to code switch where they have to dumb themselves down or box themselves in just to fit in into a certain situation or group. So one thing I would definitely say is communication. And as Jonathan said, it doesn't have to be like completely gay or completely direct. Um, because again, I can understand like everyone here knows like how it feels when somebody tries to understand you, but they end up doing too much. <laughs> and it's like, okay, like I get that you're trying, but at the same time, it's just like, Wait. tone it down. Don't, don't make it <laughs> obvious. So it's like a certain level of empathy, a certain level of um, communication, a certain level of understanding is what I would really want from the government agencies, from the workers, from the social workers, which I do see a lot of you do. So I do thank you for that. <laughs> um, but in terms of dealing with the youth or dealing with um, your, I can never say the word, peers, um, is more so like really try to get to understand where they're coming from because everyone comes from different, like some people might come from suburban areas, some people might come from urban, some people might come from the projects, some people might be a little more prudish, some people like to do more street. Um, you have to understand like where their mindset is in terms of like you have to have a very broad but specific um, understanding of them as a person in order to understand, okay, how can I best treat you as a person? Like, you're not just gay, you have other cards to you as well, because they might be black, they might be a form of Spanish, they might be Asian, and it's like that influences it as well, because each community treats LGBTQ differently. So they all might have a different problem when it comes to being gay, or even when it comes to their own race, or even financial situation. Sorry, financial situations as well. Thank you. No problem. Um, Sarah, oh, sorry. Oh, which oh, 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 okay, cool. Um, so I run the uh, LGBTQ competency tree. Uh, competency. I cannot speak today. <laughs> competency. It's not just me. <laughs> Give me a second. It's, I'm Puerto Rican's coming up. <laughs> um, <laughs> competency training. Uh, Jericho, and one of my favorite things is when somebody comes in and goes, oh yeah, my cousin's gay, I know about this. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, okay. Um, yeah. And so, you know, and I went to Hunter College. <clears throat> so, uh, I'm gonna, if you don't have your master's, I'm gonna allow you to, to put MSW behind your name after I tell you this. The work isn't about teaching people what gay means, lesbian means, trans means, any of that. The work is getting people to unlearn the things they think they know. Mm -hmm. um, and once you get that, if you could get a worker, a clinician, anyone to admit to saying two things, you have succeeded as a clinician. It's, I don't know, and sorry. Mm. If, you get those, if you get those two things down packed, you are a great clinician. You won't get your L, but you'll, get, you'll be a great <laughs> clinician. Um, and so, you know, there's so many times that, you know, someone goes to a training and they, and they sit the two-hour training, whether it's online or in person, and they get so... Um, so empowered, right? They feel so like, oh, I get this, I wanna change the world, and they think that that two-hour training gave them everything they need to know to be part of the community, and that is not true. And that goes for anything you go to, any competency training you go to, right? If we talk about African-Americans, we talk about Latinos, Asians, it doesn't matter, right? No two-hour training is gonna give you the culture and heritage of anybody you talk about. Um, and so it's just supposed to give you a glimpse of what to do and how to do it, right? But once you get in there, you have to put that in the context of the people you work with. Um, and letting them be the um, experts of their lives and allowing them that space to do that is where you need to be. Um, and we're gonna mess up. We're going to mess up. I mess up all the time. Um, but if you're not willing to say, I'm sorry, then you're no different than every other person who purposely tried to hurt them. Mm. There's no difference between the, per the person who was malicious and not, if you're not willing to say, I'm sorry. And for a lot of our young people, they haven't heard sorry their whole lives, not from their parents, not from a provider that misgendered them, not from uh, the HRA person who denied them food stamps. They never heard sorry. And so if you give them that, if you give them the power just to even hear about that, oh. ooh, I'm, I guess ooh, I'm mood lighting. tough. <laughs> um, the mental cool styling stuff. Uh, karaoke's supposed to be afterwards. Um, so yeah, so again, if you say sorry, you'll be doing something more therapeutic than giving them a prescription more than trying to get through that trauma they went through when they were three, four, five years old, you're really gonna be giving them something that they can walk around with and be uh, happy about. 
Uh, so please be okay with saying, I don't know, I'll get back to you. And please be okay with saying, I'm sorry, I messed up. Okay? Thank you. Um, thank you all for your wisdom and your insight. Um, I think you know something that is so important to remember is that in LGBTQ plus affirming spaces, you know, some people ask at Sage, like, why do we need to separate people, right? But the thing is, people are still under attack. And when we cultivate a space that is affinity based and includes peers and allies, there is so much room for healing and for resilience and to not be defined by trauma, but to be defined by these things we were talking about, like joy and creativity and um, magic making that is about being queer. So um, LGBTQ plus affirming housing, I think offers so much possibility for that and, and um, would love to open it up to some audience Q&A if anyone has any questions. I think the mic up here is on, I think. Round of applause to Jonathan. Yay. Thank you, Jonathan. Hi, thank you, everybody. Really great presentation, and I've actually visited um, both of your projects, and they're tremendously impressed. Um, one of my questions has to do with what you were just saying, that most supportive housing now is kind of 60-40, right? So there's a, generally a combination, and I know at um, Jericho project, it works well with the two populations, but in terms, I'm a developer, and so thinking about developing buildings where you have a mix of populations, there's a community units, and then supportive units, are there things in particular that we should focus on when we're developing projects like that? Uh, when the development of Walton happened, there was uh, a lot of thought behind the community room specifically, um, and so we have two actual community rooms. We have one for veterans and one for young adults. Um, and for the most part, they get used, uh, but around the, the pandemic when we had to like really manage that, um, we had one community room that we really focused on and we moved away from calling it the veteran community room and now call it the community room. Um, and it works for us. Um, I don't know if it will work for a, a program that has a mixed population like that because it took a lot of time for us to try to blend that in. Um, but I would say that at least having space that people can separate amongst themselves works, so having multiple community rooms, having space for people to decompress, I think helps. Um, but it really takes about, it, for me, it's always about engagement, right? If you're engaging every single person, even if they're community apartments, it's about getting that standard of like, this is what we accept here, this is our, this is our, um, our pillar of, of whatever we're trying to do, um, and to get on board, and if not, usually the people who are not on board with that will isolate themselves mm -hmm. and either move out or stay away from that. But if you let that voice kind of be the pervasive voice, then you're kind of creating dissension amongst your building. And with a 60-40, you will be outnumbered. <laughs> so make sure that you are always kind of like being upfront about the, the love and the acceptance you're trying to create there at your building. Yeah, I think culture setting from the jump, like from the very beginning with developer, service provider, property management, and then the tenants in like the leasing up, in the lease up interview, in, every part of the process can really help instill like what this community is and what is expected in terms of be behavioral commitments to one another too. Yeah, and to add to that right now, we're, we're doing interviews for potential residents and it's one of the main things we do is make sure that if a client doesn't identify within the community, they, we educate on allyship. We ask, are you an ally? Do you understand? And if, they, if they're like, I don't know what that means, we make sure we take a second to just explain what the community is going to be like and that everybody's there to support one another, regardless of how you identify. And if you don't identify with the community, you're more than welcome. But we're going to expect that you're kind and respectful to everyone equally at all times. So setting that standard from the moment, not just on the back end, but on the front end with your tenants, I think is a key. Yeah. Uh, when we did interviews for the veterans as well, uh, we let them know from the jump this is what the building was going to be. Yeah. Uh, most of them said, okay, I don't care. And um, some people said, no, I respectfully decline. Yeah. Um, and we thought that some people would just lie and say, yeah, because it's, you know, it's housing and they're homeless and they want to get it. But some people are true to themselves. They're like, I don't accept this. And they'll back out of their own. Yeah. Uh, but it has to be their choice. Unfortunately, you can't just weed that out. So being upfront allows them to make that decision. Absolutely. And you can circle back to it later on and say, we told you <laughs> when I had this interview, <laughs> this is what's going to be. So. Hi. Hi. 
Um, could you explain what hort horticultural therapy is? Yes, the best thing ever. Um, <laughs> horticultural therapy is using plants uh, to provide therapy. Uh, we, on the, on the basic end, it's really about using the life cycle of a plant to understand about trauma, heal through that. But on the high end of it, it's just, just messing around with plants, having fun, uh, messing with soil. Uh, I have a video that I wish I could show that literally we're creating um, some soil from cocoa core and um, some substrates, which some people don't know what I'm talking about, but as the, as the clients are, are playing with it, you can hear the giggling and having fun. Mm. It's, a, it's a very therapeutic thing. Um, and it's also about teaching them about the life cycle, right? That sometimes leaves fall off and they grow back, right? And then sometimes the whole plant dies and we have to start all over again. Um, but you know, you can make that to mirror trauma. You can use that to mirror uh, people's own uh, mental health status at the moment um, and allows them to kind of like take joy in something. Um, and it's not like a, a animal, so you don't have to like you know spend extra money to feed it. You just <laughs> water and light. Um, and then uh, I'm sorry. Last thing is also um, the great thing about it too is that you know when you don't know anything about plants, you just think water the plant, you'll be fine. But if you water too much, uh, you're going to kill that plant. And so it's about you know what is it that that plant needs, right? Being in tune to the soil, being in tune to the type of plant you have. And for a lot of uh, tenants, being grounded and being mindful in that moment really does help. continues to be a lack of understanding and trauma, how you counsel clients that are experiencing things that traumatized them before they came to you? Trauma-informed care, always. Um, making sure that uh, you meet the individual where they're at in that moment and what they've gone through, more than anything, than anything validating that experience. Validating that, yes, you are experiencing racism, sexism, ableism, um, homophobia, all of those things do exist in our society and it's not in your head and that did happen to you. And I think really just creating a space where you validate someone's experience and you start there and you say, I believe you, I know you went through all of this and I understand how it led you to where you are and I'm not blaming you anymore for the result of where your life has come, it's a result of society and it's society's issue, it's not your issue. As I'm. I'm a little person and one of the main things I had to learn about life is there was nothing wrong with me at being a small person. It's society that had the problem with me. And so I kind of start from there with understanding that society is the issue and we're working on that and you can advocate for yourself, but take care of yourself along the way. You don't have to always be the bigger person. You don't always have to educate other people. Take care of yourself first and understand that the experiences you're having are real and valid and um, start from there. I'm not gonna let you go first anymore. You always take my answers. Um, <laughs> so on top of that, um, you know, depending on what your role is at the agency, it's not always about therapy, right? So let's say you're the front desk staff, just greeting them um, and being a friendly face and someone who respects PGP and you know is not gonna say um, homophobic remarks is a start. So you know, little things like that does help. Um, and also, some of them are not ready to deal with that trauma yet. Yeah. Uh, they're not at that space. So it's about you know giving them little skills and little tools that they can do along the way to get them through the day, to get them through the week. Um, and, I, and I see it a lot with anger. Uh, anger really does manifest, especially when they don't get their way. It's like, oh, you told me you're gonna do this, and it's because they, they're being reminded about all the other people who have uh, kind of let them uh, let them down in the past. So creating a space where they could, like I have a Zen room in, uh, near my office where they can go in, have aromatherapy, a beautiful couch, the, we, we bought different lights that kind of set the mood. They can go in there if they need to like balance themselves out uh, and they come out when you, when you have the words that you want to say to me, you know, I get it. And I don't take anything personal. The next day it's like, oh, hey, John, how you doing? Okay, cool. And like, what, I cursed you out yesterday. I'm, I'm like, yeah, and today's a different day, right? <laughs> um, so, you know, kind of doing that. So there's the therapeutic end, but then it's just the day-to-day, -day, like, how do I support you? Yeah. I think also checking in with ourselves as people working with other people and staying away, being conscious of when voyeurism might be happening. So I think I have seen this a lot in this community of peers that I have is like, don't ask questions because you're interested and are fascinated and want to learn about someone's harm, right? It's our job to educate ourselves on what the community is facing and the challenges that people have. But voyeurism in particularly 
mental health care is still such an issue, I would say, particularly for trans communities. We don't ask about people's bodies. We don't ask, uh, we are not here to be consumed, right? None of us are. And so just being conscious of like what's coming up for us as professionals when we're interacting with a person is so important. Yeah, and just to add to that, um, there's a, this is a weirdness when it comes to like trans folks where we objectify them in a way that we don't do to anybody else. And so I always use this example, you know, if a cisgendered woman comes into a room and we, you know, either because she shared or not, that she had a hysterectomy, no one's going around asking her, like, does, you know, excuse my language, but does her vagina still work? Or, like, is she still pleasing her man, right? We don't do stuff like that. But when it comes to a trans person, we're like, oh, do you still have a vagina? Do you, does your penis still work? And it's like, what? It's like, why would you ask somebody that question? It's like, we're, we're programmed to know that it's wrong in one set of individuals, but when it comes to trans folks, we objectify them. Um, and in a lot of ways, we dehumanize, uh, dehumanize them. So just always ask yourself, why am I asking this question? Do I need to know? Is it a service of the work? If not, don't ask. <laughs> it's not worth, I mean, very little professions need to know those answers. Um, anyway, that's my little soapbox. Which one? Hello. Uh, you touched upon it when you answered, I don't know where she sat, but about the community rooms, like design considerations. But I want to ask the question one more time, maybe a little differently, uh, to see what your take on for apartments. Uh, I also work for an affordable housing developer. And I was just wondering, are there any specific design considerations or features in your housing developments, whether it's Pop A, Walton House, or the Stonewall House, um, that caters the unique needs and preferences to LGBTQ communities? Um, and then the second question is, um, you talked about belonging. So I wanted to just know, like, what are, like, do you have any LGBTQ specific community programs or events that foster a sense of belonging and, conne and connection amongst the residents? I can speak to the events um, to start. Um, the events wise, uh, one of the things we do um, at Homeward is around the holidays, which can be one of the hardest times of the year uh, for any population of human being, uh, LGBTQ specific as well. Uh, we always create a, we, we create a sense of family. So we'll have support groups, support networking, where all of the residents are welcome to come and have a space to go to. So if you don't have someone to share Christmas, Thanksgiving, the Jewish holidays, anything with, we create a space where you can share and where you can feel a sense of family and belonging. So that's one of the ways we try to create that um, community is we, at least once a month, we have some kind of support group in our community lounge. We have a community lounge like Jericho Project. And we're actually gonna have a gym in our new center as well. So we'll be able to do some fitness classes, anything where you can create activities and things to do so the residents not only interact with us as sports staff, I think it's just as if not more important to connect residents with what we call natural support, each other, to meet each other, to create that chosen family, to create those supports. So around the tougher times of the year or every day of the year, they're able to find people to connect with. So we make intentional um, effort on creating support groups at least once a month, hopefully in this new project every couple of weeks to make sure that the residents are able to speak with one another. Uh, to add on to that question, um, for, for us it's about input. So the more input you get from the people you're yeah. working with, the better it gets. Um, so when it comes to the color of the walls that we're gonna use, the furniture, uh, the quotes that we have on the wall, um, the, the programming that we're gonna have, those are all ways that you can try to be more inclusive. Um, food is a really, really big unifier. Uh, yes. We have food. Uh, I always say I do not deny anybody food. It's, it's always amazing to bring people around. Um, and then for your first question, um, Walton was allowed to do something that I don't think other programs are gonna be able to do uh, moving forward. But again, this is, this is the, the highlight of us being kind of the first, is that uh, our floor, so we are uh, technically 11 story building. Um, the floors two through four are young adults, five through 10 are veterans. Um, I don't know if we're allowed to separate folks like that in the future. Uh, but they allowed us to do that because I think they were so scared about having those two populations together. They were like, yeah, go ahead and do that. Um, so if they do allow that, and if it is something, I think that that's best to put people who, uh, I, I hate saying it this way, it's not the way I mean it, but identify being together, um, especially around age because we, one young adult had a um, flood in their apartment. We had to transfer him for about two months to a veteran apartment. Horrible, we got so many complaints. He plays music too much, he has too many guests. He does, so we're like, yeah, this is not gonna work. Uh, his neighbors were all 70 years old, so <laughs> I think 
he, he definitely was not welcome there. Uh, so that in alone stopped a lot of the infighting that they had. So having separation like that does help with uh, with that uh, with you know creating a, a safe space for everybody. And uh, I will oh sorry, no, I will ahead. always preach to universal design, which is more about accessibility, mm -hmm. but making sure that there's always universal design anywhere you go, so everybody has equal access to all space, and that all of the studios, all of the apartments look the same. Yeah. So there's no there's no the community that gets a different space than anyone else. It's completely equal equal access for all, regardless of any identity that you have. Our developers made a mistake and made the 10th floor windows from, from ceiling to floor. And for them, they think it's the penthouse. It's the same exact <laughs> size. They're like, I want those apartments. They're like, oh my god. So they're like, this sounds sad, but they're all like rooting for each other to die so they can get that apartment. Because <laughs> they're usually older adults. So like, yes, he's 73 and he's coughing. Like, you're not going to get it. But anyway. Um, I will just share that at Sage, we've developed um, a developer toolkit for key considerations around building LGBTQ affirming housing. And it's on our website. And one of those components is design considerations. And so things to think about in terms of universal design, accessibility, trauma-informed design, the lighting of a space, how big you should have the rooms. We also have our Sage Senior Centers on the first floor of the two buildings, and so having a senior center that's LGBTQ affirming on site has been really wonderful in terms of not only supporting seniors in the building, but bringing people in from the surrounding community to engage and really integrate in the community. But I'm happy to share that and give you my info because we also have a primer that showcases models of this type of housing across the country and talk about design considerations as well. Um, on that note, how do you manage to create affinity spaces in light of marketing requirements that require anti-discrimination and fair housing laws so you can't, you know, you can't put up a lottery unit on the HPD lottery that is only for queer people. Um, anyone can apply to it. So how do you go about creating those spaces in light, in light of that? That's the big question. Yeah, yeah. we kind of spoke about that earlier. Um, if it's, I mean, on our end, we're working with the city. So it's really about working with CBOs that work with the population you're trying to attract uh, so that they are the ones applying for it. Um, but on the end, if I'm thinking about the fair housing part of it, it's about kind of going out there saying, hey, you know, maybe if your agency has the ability to uh, put advertisements out, advertising in the village, advertising in, in certain drop-in centers saying, hey, there's a lottery happening for these types of apartments, please apply, right? If you increase the number of LGBTQ folks applying, then likewise, you're gonna get more LGBTQ people being selected, right? Even if it's random. So uh, it's just about accessibility, getting them the same amount of information that people in the Upper West Side, the Upper East Side are getting. Um, yeah. And networking, know your agencies, know who your partners are, who prioritize. And it's also language, priority to the LGBTQ community is the language we use in all our marketing. Um, but also just we do active outreach to our partner agencies, Ali Forney's, Adore, Marsha's House. We know all these places and we make sure that we prioritize outreach and let them know we want your clients to be lined up, we want your clients here, we want all clients, but your clients, uh, we want to make sure yeah. H we work with them to get them higher on the interview list than other clients, if we can, um, to make sure that it's equitable for all. So just really that networking is key. That toolkit I mentioned also has some marketing <laughs> techniques, so I, I'm happy to share that too around really intentional outreach and marketing under fair housing law, because that's a, one of the biggest questions we get. Uh, thank you, this is great. Um, so I used to work for a developer, and a few years ago we opened a building that was about half of it was supportive, supportive units, and most of those supportive units served you know, young adults, LGBTQ+, uh, coming from the shelter system. And so it came to be that like basically us as the developer and the social service provider were like woefully unequipped to deal with this population. Um, so what it showed me was that you know not all, ser all service providers are not made alike. So I would be curious as to your thoughts if you were on the developer side, like what you would be looking for in a provider to serve this specific population. Um, for me, it's more so do they have the history of working with this population? Um, what it, and you can ask me like, what is your motivation to opening this, right? Uh, I know for Jericho, this is the first time they had worked with this population, so I mean, that was a gamble. Uh, but they had a taste of it working with rapid rehousing, um, and so uh, it was about making sure that the staff that they were hiring 
knew the work, right? That they're gonna have to train that staff. Um, and so what happened was that Walton now becomes really the hub for us teaching others how to work with this population, which it should be, right? This is where the, um, the kind of the, the seed happened. Um, but if you're getting a population that's just looking, uh, if you get an agency that's just trying to make extra money and be on the top of the list and get, you know, be the agency that has 17 supportive housing programs, they're probably not the best person to work with because they're just doing it for the numbers game and not because they actually care about the population. And it doesn't mean they can't get there, but they're probably not the best ones to start off the project. Um, and so really asking questions about, you know, what is the familiarity with the population? Um, you know, are they getting their, uh, do they have the staff already chosen? Are they getting them trained? You know, those types of questions I think is really important um, before you open a, a, a program like that. For Jonathan, uh, have you ever tried any intergenerational programming uh, where you have young adults and and veterans? Uh, yes. Has uh, that been successful? Yes. Uh, I will say about 90% of our programming is intergenerational. Uh, it's been successful. Um, the only time it isn't successful, it has nothing to do about being LGBTQ. It's about uh, the vets usually feeling like the young adults aren't taking advantage of the resources that they have. Um, you know, the, the vets uh, at our program have tried to take on this role of being a mentor. And so what happens is they get really upset. They do everything that you t get taught in social work school to not uh, have those uh, transferences. Mm -hmm. uh, they really feel like, hey, you know, if I was their age, I would have done this and this and this and this and this. I'm like, yeah, but remember when you were that age, you didn't do this and this and this and this. <laughs> um, so there's a lot of that stuff. Um, but overall, they, they have a great time. Um, they share stories. Uh, the vets, when I remember when I first got the position, I was petrified. I was like, what am I getting myself into? Uh, but they are very, they want to learn each other's culture. Uh, the, the young adults are constantly asking questions about what it is like to be in war, what it's like to be a veteran. Um, we thought we have some that want to enlist. They don't want to enlist, so that was interesting. Um, so like those types of conversations happen. Um, and we know it's successful because they, they happen when we're not there. Right? So when we leave for the day, we find out that they're still continuing those conversations. They're still doing the potlucks. They're still doing those things together as a, as a group. Um, so yeah, that's, that's our intent. We just hope that they are continuing to be cordial to each other. But actually, it's been better than that. OK. And, and one question for Sydney. Does Sage ever get involved as a joint development partner on, 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 on new projects, or pretty much just providing the toolkit and possibly managing the, uh, the, the LGBTQ center within um, the building? So we've not been a developer. I think that has felt like a, a big undertaking because <laughs> um, Sage has not been a developer. But um, we worked closely with the developers of the two buildings and are the service provider. And I, I mean, I'm not going to speak for our CEO, but I think there might be interest at some point in learning more about how to do some kind of joint venture. Um, we are doing some more intensive work in Baltimore, working closely with the developer there to think about um, developing this type of affirming housing in Baltimore and not quite sure what that relationship will look like. But honestly, it's just been a capacity issue because development is such a, a lofty undertaking. Um, but maybe in the future, we'll see. Hi, um, I loved your points about um, kind of the openness to learn and, and sort of unlearning process um, and, and addressing this and like being more open, um, particularly from like the service provider staff perspective. Um, and I wondered in thinking about, I know we've mentioned the um, kind of creating safe spaces in, in shelters. Um, I, I wondered if you have perspectives on, on how to address like anti-LGBTQ sentiments with other clients who might not identify as allies or, or with that community. Um, I uh, previously, before Homeward, I was working in a substance use treatment center, um, and it was absolutely a barrier we faced as we were starting to bring in um, clients who identified in different ways, and um, our community was struggling with acceptance, rejection. One of the things we did is support groups, and, and not just support groups, but educational groups. So we noted, we took a moment to say, okay, these, these are the populations that are struggling. And we, as service staff, took it upon ourselves to come in and create an educational group around it, to speak to it, and to create a space where the clients could speak to one another and with a service staff um, monitoring that conversation to make sure it was safe for everybody. Um, because the more that people can sit down in a room and get to know each other, 
the more you'll see because I've, I've been surprised by clients and how open they are once they just sit down and talk to somebody. So trying to create those spaces where the residents, whoever you're working with, are able to speak with one another um, in a safe space with a professional sitting there as well, sometimes it's a great way for people to let people learn from each other a little bit um, without putting the full burden on the minority community and said, we'll take on some of that burden and create a space, but invite everybody to come in and learn for a moment. And if you can, sometimes make it mandatory. Make sure that all residents have to come because this is, especially if it's a problem and people aren't being accepted, making groups like that mandatory for your, your residents to continue residing, whatever, whatever you're legally able to do. Yeah, I used to work at Safe Horizon Streetwork. Um, and Safe Horizon, uh, Streetwork itself, it wasn't geared to any specific population except you had to be homeless and be a young adult. Um, but we're situated next to California Center, next to all these other programs that, that specifically like excel in working with LGBTQ uh, individuals. So we had, our, we had a skew of people who weren't um, LGBTQ identified, but because the you know everybody's trying to get services and resources, we had a mixture in the drop-in, and so for us it was about being present and being able to like catch those conversations that are going are kind of like left, uh, and addressing it. And so giving the staff tools to how to address those things, the language of how to address those things, um, not letting any little thing slide because uh, then it gives the it gives the person saying the the derogatory information, hey, I can do this, and it gives the person hearing it like, oh my God, I'm not going to be safe here even if it's a small thing, so it's just addressing everything. Um, that's when, like, adding the pride flags, you know, here and there so people can see it. Um, and it has to be, like, it, it can't just be in your face. In my, like, it just can't be, like, we're throwing glitter on ourselves and, like, walking <laughs> around. It has to be strategic. <laughs> I have to wear glitter every day at work. <laughs> <laughs> but um, it's about, like, being intentional about what we're doing. Um, and, again, creating space. It's like if people who have multiple kids, they love playing with each other, but they, get, they fight when you put them in the room for too long, right? So giving them their own space to kind of, like, this is, Okay, this is what we're doing, and you know the the grant that was uh, that was providing my income back then uh, was one working with trans folks who were high risk of getting HIV, and working with uh, recently um, released uh, black men from uh, Rikers. So I was like, how am I going to have support groups with both these two populations? <laughs> and it actually worked. Um, and you know, and I I kind of left the space for them to talk and, and just like share ideas with each other. Uh, it went really well. I thought that was going to be a brawl, and it went really, really well. But it's about somebody really sitting there and being intentional about the conversations, about calling people out uh, in a very productive way, right? Not trying to humiliate either side, but it's about saying, hey, no, that's actually wrong. Uh, and again, saying, I'm sorry. I, I can't tell you how many times I said I'm sorry in that meeting, because I, I would say the stupidest things back then. I still do now. Um, but yeah. I think also still going back to the community agreements that are not necessarily a, a policy or even anything that's legal that someone signs, but just an agreed upon statement that no racism is accepted here, no transphobia is accepted here, and this is establishing the culture when someone moves into the space. And then you have something to point to when harm happens and say, okay, um, we have a protocol for how we address this. There's um, an anonymous feedback that people can provide because especially with queer elders, people don't always feel safe um, naming harm that has happened with neighbors, and so having some kind of anonymous feedback process and then a conversation with someone who might have committed harm around not that person being harmful, but the behavior, looking at the behavior and not the whole person. Any other questions? Let's see, I had a few more questions. Um, can I ask one more question? What has been one of the biggest challenges either in doing this work or in being in, in this community space, in, the, in this housing? I would say developing a thick skin. Um, not only well, not only developing a thick skin, but also being very empathetic, but at the same time, knowing how to, well, as Jonathan said, and um, not to, uh, not tolerate racism, homophobia, or any type of phobia, or any type of ism, because when you're dealing with people who are hurt, or dealing with people who come across from traumatic backgrounds, people tend to lash out for the littlest things, or lash out anytime when they feel hurt, or, or 
what's the word I'm looking for, hurt or um, or they feel like they're being attacked. So when you're dealing with people like that, you tend to have to develop a thick skin in terms of like, okay, you may lash out me today, but then to, as Jonathan said, tomorrow's a new day. We can you know clean the slate and try again. Um, so when you're dealing with um, people who are been hurt or people who have a natural tendency just to lash out anytime when they feel like they've been attacked or feel like they've been um, hurt in any way, you have to understand like, okay, I understand where you came from. I understand that you're here. Um, I understand that you may have mistook my words as an attack, but I didn't mean it that way. So I now have to learn how to properly talk and conversate with you in terms of not to trigger you, in terms of not to register this as an attack to your character. And then you also have to under they also have to understand as well, like, okay, I may have overreacted. Now let me see, give this person a chance. And like it kind of goes in that back and forth that, okay, I'm trying to understand you, you're trying to understand me. And that just goes into just the basic communication and empathy, which some people do lack. But for the people that don't, or the people who have that thick skin or have that power of empathy, it's very helpful in these spaces because, as my panelists said, you do get a lot of people who come from different backgrounds, whether they're prisoners, whether they're LGBTQ, whether they're um, whether they're regular um, heterosexual, or they're from or you know from different countries. It's like you have to understand that level of communication, that level of thick skin, that level of empathy that it takes to be able to really heal somebody. Thank you. Um, for me, I, I, if you if you ask me at different times in my life, I will have a different answer. At one point it was funding um, when I was younger. Uh, now that I'm old, I uh, think that it's more about misinformation. Uh, you know, whenever I'm, I'm, I'm having space for people to share and this is not just tenants and clients, it's, this is just staff as well and people from the outside. Uh, there's so much information that's out there that doesn't quite make sense, but sounds right on paper. Uh, that when people bring that as an argument, I have to try to dismantle that while trying to be affirming, while trying, it, it's, it's like a lie. So for me, the, the challenge is about me being professional, but also being human mm -hmm. yeah. in a world where misinformation is leading the way. Um, it's, and I had this conversation two days ago where somebody was trying to, tell me about gender versus sex using gorillas. Oh. And there was like, yeah, and it didn't make sense. And then it was about like, I wish you could have been there. I wish I could have recorded it and like had people's faces. <laughs> I was like, what are we, where are we going with this? Um, so it's kind of like, and I have to kind of be professional, right? I have to sit there and let them speak and like, uh-huh, uh-huh, when back in my head, I'm going, you're an idiot. Um, so I think that's one of the challenges I have is, uh, especially being also now an educator, is mm. kind of leaving that space for misinformation to breathe um, dismantling that and then reteaching, uh, and I think that's can be a little challenging, but on a personal level. I hear that. I I was treating the NYPD once, and <laughs> I <laughs> did not respond professionally. <laughs> I got in a lot of trouble. <laughs> but it's hard when this is about like who you are in the world and who your community is, and it is harm that's being target targeted. So it's hard to hold hold all of that. Yeah, and I think uh, as a service provider, to add to that, it's it's the resident engagement that can be a challenge at times, and understanding that a client might be struggling to engage with you, and depersonalizing always, that it's not me, it's not my personal character, it's their experience with other service providers on the whole, and that it's gonna take time to trust. It may take a year, it may take two years, but our job is to every day be there, show up, and for every meeting they miss, I'm still gonna be there. I still will show up, and however you speak to me, talk to me, roll off my back, because it's, it comes from the trauma, it comes from the past, and having that escape, but also in all of that, as a service provider, taking care of yourself. If your cup isn't full, you can't help other people mm -hmm. fill their cup, so recognizing the moments when you're being drained and you're overwhelmed and maybe you need to leave for the day mm -hmm. and just go take a breath because you can no longer properly service any client that day, let alone a client maybe you're struggling with. So we should always be acting with beneficence, doing no harm, and sometimes that also you have to apply that to yourself. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And for, for managers also, you know, 
I wish this wasn't the case, but it is. When you're hiring, you, you have to look deeper than just the person, the way the person's presenting themselves, right? I know a lot of gay men who are the most transphobic people I've ever met. I know a lot of people of color who are the most racist people without being racist by definition that I've ever met. Um, and even if you look at the news now, right, some of the people doing the most harm to our communities are the people part of those communities. Mm -hmm. um, and so we have to be a little bit more intentional than just saying, oh, he's gay, yeah, he can do the job. I think that we have to be intentional about who we're bringing into the spaces that are supposed to be safe for our young people, for our elders, for anybody we're serving. Yeah, I mean, a lot of, we see this in elders across the generations, right? A lot of harm exists in LGBTQ plus community against one another. It is not a, it's not a monolith and, and harm exists amongst us too, so. Um, were there any other audience questions? Okay, I'm probably gonna ask y'all oh, if you have like. Back. Oh, we have one? Yeah, so at Walton, we are the ones receiving the 2010 E's, so we don't do the 2010 E's there. If, you're, if you have young adults who would like to be a part of Walton or would like a 2010 E done, we do service people through our rapid rehousing program. Um, so please check our website at uh, jargoproject.org. Um, <laughs> little plug in there. Um, and uh, get connected to them, and then they will, they have case managers there that will provide service, uh, assistance getting the 2010 E done. If you have a 2010 E, completed and ready to go. Uh, we do have vacancies happening periodically, so please do uh, reach out to us. Uh, the next slide might need my, my contact information, but maybe not. Um, no. Uh, <laughs> see me afterwards, <laughs> and I will give you my information, and you can, you can let me know who you are trying to get in, and I'll tell you the process of how to make sure that that happens, okay? And if anyone's looking for supportive housing for LGBTQ right now, we are actively interviewing clients. Yeah. So please, I have flyers with my information on it. Again, like you would need to have your 2010E, but we also, I can also provide information on places where you can go to make sure your clients can get that done. But if you have any young adults who um, are 18 to 25 and fall under uh, the NYC 1515, please, please come see me. I have a flyer with my contact information. We are actively housing individuals right now. They have 10,000 vacancies, we have one coming up. So <laughs> that's, that's the, so that's the, but that's the positive, well not 10,000, no, yeah, she'll kill me. But um, no, but it's more so that, you know, they're opening a brand new building, so there's gonna be much more vacancies than, yeah. than this year, yeah. Come see me. Um, well, I was gonna ask if each of my wonderful folks up here have maybe just some last words you'd like to share, any plugs you'd like to share uh, as we wrap up the conversation today. We want to start like we did, Jonathan? Sorry. OK, who, who would like to start? I don't um, know. <laughs> I would say, well, first of all, I want to say thank you to everyone in the room who actually takes the time to work with um, the LGBTQ community. Um, it really does help. Um, as far as having something to say, I want to say thank you, and I want to say enjoy what you do, because you really are <laughs> helping a lot of people actually try to make themselves better. And remember to take care of yourselves because it can be exhausting dealing with traumatic people. It can be exhausting dealing with people who have a sordid past. But uh, I just want to remind you guys just to take care of yourselves and to like really learn your own triggers, your own traumas, and learn how to not only move past them, but also like be empathetic or apply them to the people that you're dealing with, because you never know, you might have more in common with the person that you're talking to or your um, client. There we go. Um, so I just want to say thank you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> We are humans helping humans, so we all make mistakes, and I think um, as any other service providers I'm speaking with or any other, make sure you're also in mental health care. As you're doing this, have your therapist, have your support staff. Um, though we're speaking about labels specifically today, I would always say meet every person you meet with where they're at and who they are. Nobody is identified by one word. 
we're, identif we're many different identities. So when you're working with someone, though they may have a, an identity and you should have an awareness of that, I think we've touched on that today. Just, just look at them as a human being, get to know them and let them direct the conversation, let them direct you on what they need help with um, and listen and trust and take care of yourself. Next time I have a Maya Angelou quote or something ready to go. Okay. Um, <laughs> no, for um, for me, you know, we, we're talking about this in a very like specific vacuum, and what I will hope that people will take away is that uh, this population isn't a population that it's by itself. It's infused into everything we do. Um, you don't have to agree with. I hate saying this phrase, but I'll say because people say it all the time. The lifestyle. It's about being able to be there for the clients that you have and the clients that you serve. Um, if you can't do that, I'm going to respectfully ask you to think about the, the, the choice you did career-wise. This may not be the right career for you. Um, because it, it's not about, I'm going to work with young adults and they're LGBT or work with elders and LGBT. This is about that. Even if you have a building of complete veterans, somebody in there could identify as LGBTQ. You have to make sure you have those skills to be able to work with this population. And it's not about whether your, your specific religion allows you to believe in it. It's not about that. It's about treating people with dignity and respect and allowing them to have um, the support they need to be able to thrive in the environment that they have. So really think about that when you're going back to your agencies. Wow, thank you. Well, I want to thank all of our amazing panelists and the folks that came out today. I'm sure we